worship God? Glory to you, O God. Glory to you, O Christ. For us and our salvation, you will gain death, and will open the gates of everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O Blessed Trinity, now and forever. Please be seated. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Let us together confess our sin. Tender God, we have received with gratitude your salvation in Jesus Christ but sometimes we continue to lock ourselves behind closed doors, fearful of sharing your good news. We hide our wounds and pretend we need nothing. Forgive us, we pray. Bring us new life where we are tired, new love where we have become hard-hearted, forgiveness where we have wounded one another, and freedom where we are captives to ourselves. Amen.
Let's observe a time of silent confession. God so loved the world that God gave God's only son so that everyone who trusts him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send God's son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. As God has given us peace through Christ, let us share Christ's peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Share Christ's peace with one another. Well, a warm welcome to everyone this morning. It's so good to be together in worship, whether you are worshiping with us in the sanctuary or at home via the live stream. We welcome you. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you are new to Second Presbyterian Church, there are uh, blue visitors cards which are located in the pews. We encourage you to fill one out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by so that we can begin to get to know you better. Uh, if you have a prayer request, there are also yellow uh, prayer cards which are located in the pews. Please fill one out, let us know what your concern is and we will definitely be praying for you during the week. Also, we have a time of coffee fellowship following the service. We invite everyone to join us through these doors immediately following uh, the service. And now Mike Lind will bring us a minute for mission. Good morning. My name is Mike Lind. I have been asked to remind members of the One Great Hour of Sharing, a Presbyterian Church USA program providing relief from natural disasters, food for the hungry, and support for the poor and oppressed. One Great Hour of Sharing is one of four annual special offerings the other three being the Pentecost offering, the Peace and Global Witness offering, and the Christmas Joy offering. For nearly all of you, there should be these one great hour of sharing envelopes stuck like this in front of you where the other offering envelopes are. Except for people sitting way back in the corner there 
because they didn't send us enough envelopes. But feel free to reach over to this side somewhere. I'm sure there are empty pews which have one of these envelopes in them. And uh, we encourage everyone to contribute. If you just put your cash or check inside the envelope, close it up and put it in the offering plate, it will be collected. On the back of the envelope here, if you just put down your name, check how much should be in there. And if you happen to know it, your envelope number. But if you don't happen to know your envelope number, it'll get credited to you one way or the other. These offerings play an important role in defining what it means to be a connected church, a connect, connectional church. Over the years, these offerings have provided ways for individuals and congregations to join together with each other and in partnership with other Christians in responding to a variety of concerns and offer opportunities for partnership, learning, and witness that profoundly affect the life of the church as a collective witness to Jesus Christ's love for the whole church. To find out more about one great hour of sharing, you can either A, visit www.pacusa.org slash O-G-H-S. B, if you type in one great hour of sharing into uh, some search vehicle like Google, this will show up as well. Or C, see me, and back in the pastor's office, we have some materials that describe one great hour of sharing. Thank you. Let's pray. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, Speak your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first scriptural lesson is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4 reading from verses 32 through 35. It's at page 122 in your pew Bibles. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions. But everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not any person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of God to the people of God. The Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, beginning with chapter 20 and verse 19. Listen for God's word for you. 
When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the religious leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. is a word is not to my 
Amen. Following Jesus' execution, his followers went into hiding in Jerusalem. They found a secure place where they could lock themselves in. Even after Mary Magdalene tells them she has seen Jesus and he is alive, the disciples are unconvinced. Traumatized by everything leading up to Jesus' death and unable to get their minds around a resurrection, they were terrified that those who had come for Jesus would now come for them. So they hid, and they were very afraid. And then Jesus comes among them because Locked doors are no barrier for him. And he says, peace be with you. Twice he says it. And he shows them the wounds on his hands and his side. Somehow Thomas missed this. We don't know where he was or why he was absent. Maybe he needed a smoke or a breath of fresh air. Maybe it was his turn to go out and get food for everybody else. When he returns, the disciples tell him the good news. They have seen Jesus and he is alive. Thomas isn't having any of it. Show me, he says. When I get to see those wounds with my own eyes and touch them with my own hands, that's when I'll believe he's alive. And this is the occasion that earned Thomas the nickname Doubting Thomas, and it wasn't a compliment. Most of us learned about Doubting Thomas in Sunday school. 
The message many of us heard was something like, don't be like Thomas who wanted proof that Jesus was alive. Rather, have faith. Believe, don't demand evidence. Faith is good, doubt is bad. Somehow, we got the idea that doubt and faith are opposites. I don't think so. Our intellects are gifts from God, and God calls us to use all of our gifts for God's purposes. It is in our nature as intelligent human beings to ask questions and to experience doubt. In the ninth chapter of Mark, we're introduced to a heartbroken father whose son is possessed by an evil spirit that keeps him in convulsions, unable to hear or speak. And the disciples have been unable to heal him. Jesus says, all things can be done for the one who believes. And the father responds, I believe, help my unbelief. For most of us, faith and doubt coexist. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It is trusting God in the face of doubt. Today, we might call Thomas a concrete thinker or a kinesthetic learner, someone who learns through touch by using his hands. And Jesus knows and understands this about him. A week later, Jesus appears again to the disciples, and this time, Thomas is there. Jesus shows his wounds and invites Thomas to touch them. And while it isn't clear if Thomas actually touches Jesus' hands and side, what is clear is that Thomas makes a declaration of faith, addressing Jesus as my Lord and my God. I think the point is, Jesus meets us where we are and gives us what we need so that we can grow in our faith, our ability to trust God. Having doubts, that's part of the process and nothing to apologize for. Notice that the resurrected Jesus still has unhealed wounds. Resurrection has not given him a perfect, unscarred body. This is important because in this country, we tend to value strength, self-sufficiency, having it all together, not pain, failure, or weakness. A superhero Jesus is more appealing than a wounded and broken one. But the Jesus who appears to the disciples is not only wounded, he makes no effort to hide his wounds. He displays them because he knows that some of us, like Thomas, need to see them. A God with no wounds would be hard to trust because we are all wounded and we need to know that God too has been there and understands. Thinking back on my own journey to faith as a young adult, I remember people asking me what attracted me to the Christian faith. And for me, the answer was clear. A God who wasn't distant, who didn't stand out there far away, but rather knew what it meant to be human, who had experienced suffering, anger, and betrayal, that was a God I could feel close to. That was a God whose promises I could trust. In this morning's reading, Jesus also commissions the disciples to do his work. As the Father has sent me, he says, so I send you. And he breathes the Holy Spirit on them to empower them 
to do that work, the work of helping people come closer to God and to, to one another. It's no secret that Christianity is struggling in this country right now. The percentage of people who claim to follow some form of Christianity is decreasing. Those claiming no religion are increasing. Church attendance is declining. Studies suggest that the reasons for this are many. Habits changed during the pandemic. Some folks never got back in the habit of attending church. Some say that their lives are busy and being part of a church is just not convenient. And besides, church is boring. The pastors go on too long. We also know that people who have left the church often say that while they like the teachings of Jesus, they don't feel that Christians are very good at showing the love of God and neighbor, and that's a turnoff to them. Now, part of me says that there's an element of truth in this criticism because I have been wounded more deeply in the church than in any other part of my life, not this church, thankfully. But I also think that this criticism reflects a misunderstanding of what the Christian faith is all about. Jesus never demanded that his disciples pass a theology test. What he said was, follow me, let me live in you, make me visible in your life. And while all of us are in different stages of learning to live more like Jesus Christ, none of us are going to do that perfectly in this life. We all sin, we all fall short. That's why we confess sin and receive God's grace and forgiveness every week. That doesn't make us hypocrites, it just makes us human. That said, I think the question of how to reach those who are outside the church deserves our reflection. Maybe it might mean becoming more willing to admit that we too sometimes have doubts because doubts are very much part of the life of faith. Maybe it means that sometimes we pray together saying, I believe, help my unbelief. And maybe it means becoming more willing to show our wounds and show our vulnerability. Because that's what a lot of folks are looking for. Someone who looks like them, who has experienced pain and suffering as they have, and is willing to share how Jesus Christ makes a difference in their life. Jesus said to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he breathed the Holy Spirit on them, giving them and us God's power and encouragement for the work. John, who wrote the fourth gospel, says that he wrote it so that his readers, that includes us, might come to believe or trust, as I prefer to translate the original Greek, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through trusting, we may have life in his name. May it be so for you, for me, and for all of those whom God loves this whole world over. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us say together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have called us to be your followers and have given us your Holy Spirit so that we might follow you faithfully and courageously. Make us bold in sharing your love with all people. Cast out our fear. We praise you that our weaknesses are the openings through which your power can enter and work through us. Help us to trust that this is so. We pray this day for all who are in need, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Touch them at their point of need and use us to do your work. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. We pray in your name. Amen. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's worship God with our gifts.
Blessed are you, O Lord, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Siblings in Christ, the Gospels tell us that on the first day of the week, the day on which our Lord rose from the dead, he appeared to some of his disciples and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Come then to the joyful feast of our Lord. This is Christ's table. He invites everyone who trusts him to join him here. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God. In Jesus Christ, you spoke the word that brought the world into being. By the Holy Spirit, he breathed his life into each person. And when we rebelled against you, your steadfast love for us never ceased. You sent prophets to teach us your way of love, faithfulness, and justice. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs and angels, and with all the faithful of every time and place who sing to the glory of your name. and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and mercy in his voice. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power, the stone was rolled away from the tomb. He was dead and now he is alive and is with us always as he promised. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and the blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us your people, set apart to be light to the world. Make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Nurture us at this table, God, that we may know Christ's redemptive love and live a new life in him. Help us who recognize our Lord 
in the breaking of bread to see and serve him in all whose lives are broken. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your sins in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, loving God, now and forever. In unison, let us say the Lord's Prayer together. On the night of his rest, Jesus took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body, it's broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, <clears throat> in the same way also, he took the cup, said, this is in the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
us partake of the elements together. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out now in the power of your spirit to live and work for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. service begins. And what does the Lord require of us but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God? May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever and with all of those whom God loves this whole world over. Amen. <laughs>